Sutra opening Zuiho's text called Jiju Zammai, which is the, um, a name uh, or a term that uh, Dogen Zenji uses um, often, and so Menzan is being one of the uh, main revivalists, kind of Dogen revivalists, takes up that term Jiju Zammai um, for, this, um, for this work where he's trying to um, uh, recommend and to uh, help people understand what is uh, Dogen's way. Um, and Menzan was one of the, the uh, handful of um, monks in uh, the just kind of pre-modern time, you know, five or 600 years after Dogen lived, who were really creating Dogen's way. I mean, we could say Dogen had Dogen's way, but um, then this kind of idea of the foundations of what we think of as the modern Soto school, the, that in the... Uh, um, 16, 1700s, that was the time where the, you know, it's often the case, the neo-whatevers are the ones that kind of make this solid case for, um, for what earlier uh, people were doing. So that's definitely the case of uh, Menzan. The reason I bring that up is um, it kind of annoys me a little bit. Um, and um, not in a bad way, it's not so bad to be annoyed, but it's like when things get kind of this kind of clear explanations that come out of that maybe second wave of, of really trying to promote something, sometimes they're a little bit too tidy. And if I have any criticism or any, I can't even call it criticism, who am I to criticize Menzon? If I have any annoyances with Menzon, I think it comes with that kind of tidiness. He, uh, he was a fabulous explainer. So this is just one text among just, I mean, how many thousands of pages he wrote. Um, and uh, most of what he wrote about was really about orthopraxy rather than orthodoxy. So orthodoxy would be kind of what's the correct understanding of the teachings. That's what you've got in front of you here. Most of his, his writing with or, was orthopraxy. What's the correct way to practice? What's the correct way to live out the Buddha Dharma? And for him, that meant monastic forms. And so we have lots and lots of you know, modern scholars, when they go back to understand where the forms of practice of Soto Zen came from, they all go study Menzon and they talk about what Menzon um, you know, uh, uh, recommended, etc. A really amazing, uh, fabulous mind. And like all fabulous minds, slightly annoying. Um, so, I hope he's annoyed you a little bit um, uh, and also given you some things to think about. Tonight I wanted to start by looking back at the end of what we were studying <clears throat> last week, which was on page, um, it's not actually the end, it was partway through what we were studying last week. Um, it's on page 33. Um, page 33, right in the middle there, the only full paragraph on that page. He says, when we thoroughly realize that the three poisonous minds are nothing but the eternal Dharma body of the Tathagata, 
it becomes obvious that all sentient beings transmigrating in the six realms also have the nature of this eternal Dharma body and lack nothing. Since we understand this reality, we arouse Bodhi mind and vow to lead all sentient beings to the eternal Dharma body of the Tathagata. This is carrying out the practice enlightenment of a Bodhisattva. So in this paragraph, we're getting a um, really condensed presentation of what Menzon's maybe main point in this whole thing is. Um, he, he talks about changing our aspiration. Um, and that's on the bottom of page 31 um, over to page uh, 32. And I brought this up last week where he says from the bottom of page 31, the last full sentence, he says, even if one attains the state of no thought, such a practitioner with Hinayana attitude will never attain Buddhahood unless he changes his aspiration, changes his attitude. In the Chinese, the characters mean to rotate the mind, to turn the mind around. And, um, and this is one of his main points. If we go back to right at the very beginning of this text, when we are studying about in the introduction, where he says he's taking on self and other. And he talks about these two aspects of the Buddha's wake, awakening and self-illumination and other illumination. And he says there's these two aspects to the, the luminosity of the awakening of Verachana Buddha. Verachana Buddha being the Buddha that is all of the cosmos. He says one aspect is that that illumination is totally self-receiving and employing. It is just like a jewel that illuminates itself. And the other, the other facet is other illumination. And this is like the light that spreads out onto all beings and saves them from their um, ignorance, from their delusion. And I'd asked, why self and other? Why does, he, why does he take this up right at the very beginning? And that's a really fruitful exploration. But one of the things that we can cue in, uh, clue into when we pay attention to that is self and other is what we're doing all the time. Because we set self and other against each other, we take the wholeness of this illuminated jewel and we say, okay, let's split it into self and other. And let's pull the things to self that we want. Let's get the things we don't want to other. And that's the kind of divided consciousness which is fragmenting everything, which Buddha or which uh, Menzon talks about as a deluded mind or deluded consciousness. But right at the beginning, he's presenting another option, which is self-illumination is just totally self-illumination. And other illumination is just totally other illumination. And they don't conflict with each other at all. They're both present in Verachana Buddha's uh, illumination at the same time. And this kind of splitting is the issue. So when we, if we go back to that original thing we talk about, and then we look at this paragraph where he's saying, when we thoroughly realize that the three poisonous minds are nothing but the eternal Dharma body of the Tathagata, it becomes obvious that all sentient beings transmigrate in the six realms also have the nature of the eternal Dharma body and lack nothing. So even though we're in here selfing and othering all over the place and we're transmigrating in the six realms which we talked about last time, the three um, negative realms of the hell and hungry ghosts and animals and the positive realms of the angry titans or the asuras and the humans and the heavens. Even though we're going around there, gotta, 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 it's, it's, it's all this illumination of the, of the great luminous body of Verachana Buddha. And because of that, every being is completely endowed with that illumination, even though we don't, we don't recognize it. This is turning the mind around that, um, because some of you read characters. This is the characters for rotating the mind. Okay. So you, your mind's headed this direction. It's just so obvious. I'm me and you're you. I'm a self, you're another. This is me, I'm acting on the world in this way. And here it's saying, turn, turn that around. And then all of the encouragement of the Mahayana to not be trapped in this small view, like I'm going to practice. 
and through my practice, I will be awakened, Pratyeka Buddha. Okay? I'm going to practice. Through my practice, I will get rid of all of the greed, hate, and delusion in my being. Okay? Arhat practice. Those aren't bad. They're limited, he says, though. And they're limited because they're still playing by the self and other rules, the self and other split that we do in this great body of Verachana. Yeah, this is also not so, those of you who studied this a little bit, this is, this is, um, harkens to or kind of reflects Eko Henshin, which is the turning the light and shining it back. This has a kind of similar um, uh, quality to that. But here is really, is really saying, look, we should reform our attitude. We should, reform, we should reform our aspiration. We shouldn't just aspire to get the good stuff pulled towards us and to become better and better. We should aspire to the awakening to this whole thing. Right? The donkey staring in the well, seeing the reflection of the moon, and there's nothing, there's nothing divided in that. The donkey doesn't get destroyed. Right? Um, if that seems enigmatic, that's fine. You probably weren't here when I talked about that poem, so um, don't worry too much about it. So um, this is kind of where, um, uh, where we find ourselves as we go into these last few sections, which are... Um, you know, last, last week there was this kind of chart that about, the, um, uh, about greed, hate, and delusion and how greed, hate, and delusion are actually aspects of the, of the Buddha mind and the transformation of all that. I, I won't go back over that um, mm-hmm. right now. But part of what's happening in this last part of the text is a little bit like, do you ever notice this when you're reading um, um, newspaper articles? They get less interesting when you get towards the end. Do you ever notice that? They're written that way on purpose, right? Because most people don't read them all the way to the end. You sort of get through the first part. So you, you, you're front-loading all the stuff that kind of jazzes it, and then you kind of get into these certain details towards the end. And, and Menzon kind of does that here. Like he's making the big case, and then towards the end here, he's kind of showing us some examples, or he's showing us some ways that his mind works. So last time, this kind of matrix of how greed, hate, and delusion um, are, uh, are all also this, right? That the, the, that the delusion isn't shoved out of this great wholeness of the illumination of the mirror. And so he gives us a kind of like a way of thinking about that. And in this next um, section, starting on page 35, um, at the bottom there, he's going to... Um, um, He's going to talk about this in terms of the elements uh, in our bodies and our minds, etc. Oh, I guess the thing I read was right at the end of what we did last time. Um, so, don't get too excited. <laughs> the first time I used this, I wrote all my notes on the back side, <laughs> not thinking about and then I flipped it over and they were all upside down. So let's talk a little bit about elements and then we can talk about how it is that, um, that uh, uh, men's on uses them and maybe why he's so... Um, I seem to do this every week. So, um, he lists them in kind of the opposite order that they would normally be listed in. They would be normally listed as space, wind, fire, water, and earth. And in Buddhism, these are called the five elements. And they're very similar to the five ele- or four elements that we tend to think about in Western um, kind of elemental reasoning, that's a thing. Um, we usually don't have space, right? So we have usually a, air, fire, water, uh, and earth. But in the um, uh, Buddhist uh, cosmology, space is always um, also included. One thing that's kind of interesting to know about this space is space here is also the same, the character in um, Chinese is this. This is also the character that's used for emptiness. So it means sky, generally speaking. Oh, that's what Smalley Poe can't read it, sorry. But um, this character right here, 
um, is used as an element here, but it also has a little bit bigger meaning um, because it's used it's, it's used to mean emptiness. Um, uh, wind, fire, water, earth. You can see this um, in stupas. So um, one that you'll see here, but it's a little hard to see what's going on, is the, the wooden post that's opposite from the main hall here. That's called a, a square stupa or kaktoba in Japanese. It's a kind of stupa. And stupas originally were um, like a... Um, what would be the right word for it? They were the Buddha's body. Uh, created by his followers. And so the five elements were, um, the stupas were made in the shape of the five elements as a representation of the body of the Buddha. And oftentimes inside one of those stupas there might be a relic, like a tooth from the Buddha or from a great ancestor. Or some of them were built over footprints. There's famous footprints in Sri Lanka. I haven't visited South Asia, so I hope to go there someday. But there's one, you can go to a stupa where there's a footprint of the Buddha that was like, preserved. It was like in the mud and they built a big thing around it and everything. So, um, so there's oftentimes a relic in it, but then the stupa itself is a symbol of the, um, of the body of the Buddha and they're made in this kind of shape. kind of stylized but if you ever look at those of you who've been Japan before or seen pictures of that gravestones often are shaped this way you'll see them you'll see them kind of a, they'll be kind of a, a shape like um, like this and then there'll be the rest of the grave down there sometimes you can see um, uh, various things uh, shaped like this in China these shapes mostly became um, pagodas. So usually the most common pagodas are five, there are five um, stories. So, you know, there'll be, I'm not gonna do it justice, but you know, it's like there'll be five sections like this. And each section has its, you know, its kind of little rampart. And though those are a Chinese version of um, a stupa, right? These the stupas in in uh, China typically are filled with uh, sutras. Oftentimes they have the sutras in the middle, and then you can go in and you can push. It'll be like in a big rotating thing, and you can push and turn it around, a little bit like the prayer wheels that you see in uh, Tibetan Buddhism. But it'll be like a massive one, and you can go turn them around. Those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So anyway, the reason I bring this up is because the five elements are really part and parcel to Buddhist teachings and they're like fundamental to how um, uh, Buddhists have traditionally thought about what it means to be embodied. Right? So here he starts to say that the world, the mind and the body are not two. They're not separate. And where he goes to is to say they're all the elements and the elements show up in different ways. That circle that I had drawn before, it splits into all of these elements. He says later on, when our mind comes to a mind object, right? when, we, when we perceive a mind object, the mind takes the shape of the five elements, and then the world takes the shape of the five elements uh, in relationship to the mind's shape of the five elements. And he uses this way of describing what's the way that we go from this wholeness into the particularity. And so he wants to describe uh, he wants to describe how that how that functioning happens. He's using it as an example of how that one that one uh, circle I keep drawing um, is not it's not everything kind of pushing on each other. It's everything um, dependently arising. So in that process, he um, he's going to talk about what are the um, uh, what are the qualities this when it comes to the body? And so he says the earth are his bones. He says the water is, does he say fluid? Is that how he says it? Oh, he says moisture. He says fire is heat. Wind is movement. Uh, and space is where it all unfolds. <clears throat> So 
So he's saying that um, this is what makes up a body. It's very different than our modern um, thinking about what it is that um, makes up a body. But classical um, medicine um, in the East, etc., all works on this, this idea. And um, if you go in Chinese medicine in particular, I don't know Ayurvedic medicine very much, but uh, Chinese medicine in particular, it goes into all of these things in great detail. And then all of the organs, etc., are related with certain elements. And then if the element in one place gets too strong, it affects another thing. And it's a very holistic approach to how to bring harmony to the body in the balancing of the, um, of the very various elements. Then he goes on to say that um, these are also um, facets of the mind. Ignorance is associated with earth or with the bones. Water is desire. Heat is anger. Okay. So these three basic building blocks, greed, hate, and delusion, here, greed, hate, and delusion, anger, desire, ignorance. We've been using different um, translations uh, of those. And then, um, and then he says, wind is pleasure. And again, space is the um, uh, is uh, where everything takes place. He calls it the traceless appearance and disappearance. You haven't written them, but you can figure it out. So he says these are, that's what's happening in the mind. And that the, and that the world is built of this. So you have the world, you have the body, and you have the mind. And that these are all facets of, um, uh, of uh, how these five elements work. Now, a thing to know about Menzon is, as many of the teachers of his time and these people who developed modern Soto Zen, most of them have also, uh, had also studied in esoteric schools pretty significantly. So Menzon had studied in the Shingon school and Tendai school, I believe. And those schools super focus on this. And the way in which the elements are um, interpenetrating and the way that they are... Um, and I say, the way that they may be encountered through meditative practice or mandala manipulation or mantra becomes really a foundational way that those schools work with um, uh, liberation. And so someone like Menzon was super schooled in that, but he was a Soto Zen priest and actually moved away from a lot of that stuff and kind of, while well, he used it, he also was like, okay, but the one thing to do is Zazen. And all of this is inside of Zazen. And that's part of what made Menzon um, and his uh, cohort be able to do what they did because they said, look, this is all, you know, we use the word Zazen, but this is all contained within Zazen. And um, to be kind of all enfolding in that way, which can be annoying, but I think it has a big strength. And the big strength is it asks us to find the true significance of those things rather than just to deal with them as a kind of like chunk of knowledge. You know, like now you know this, whether that's going to be helpful to you too or not, is pretty doubtful. Um, but if you take this and then you realize, oh, this is all comes back to something core, something fundamental, then you've got to wrestle with it, not just use it as a kind of um, further piece of information that you can, um, that you can uh, manipulate with your mind and not really... Um, uh, hook down into the, the deeper motivation. So, this is kind of his, uh, I could say, exploration of space, another way that he is exploring space, the way that they all happen. And what does he say about that? You know, why is this uh, kind of thing important? Um, let's look at that on page, um, it's on page 36, down at the bottom. Oh, I do like this bit that he, that he, uh, he uh, quotes from Ninzai. 
where he says, doubt in your mind becomes earth and you will be obstructed by it. Desire in your mind becomes water and you will drown in it. Anger in your mind becomes fire and you will be burned by it. Pleasure in your mind becomes wind and you will be carried away by it. So these are the, and these all have a physical aspect. If you're working with the physicality of encountering karma, um, one thing I talk with people a lot about is fire and anger. Like that's like, and you, and you, like this, it's not, it's symbolic, yes, but it's also really the element in your, in your, in your body that when you're working with anger, you may not see fire, but you may, but it's the fire quality. It is like being burned. And we see this just echoed in so many places, people using that um, fire when they're talking about working with anger. So this kind of teaching can be really helpful for that. You see that, um, you know, you will, uh, um, uh, anger will be fire and you'll get burnt. So how are you going to work with that burning? You know, becomes a kind of inroad to um, understanding your karma. So at the bottom of page 36, then uh, he comes back to what is, seems like a constant refrain um, stated in a slightly different way. Therefore, when you admit the original light which is beyond the dimension of thought and illuminate illusory mind, then body, mind, and the world becomes the Verachana Tathagata. This is almost like the, just a rephrasing of the introduction to the whole thing. Okay? Now, you remember last week I was talking about, he used, there, there's a term in here that is translated from the light, uh, from the uh, Heart Sutra, clearly seeing. That is also used here, but he doesn't translate it so it's so easy to see that it's showing up there. Remember in the Heart Sutra, Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva, clearly seeing that all five aggregates are empty. That line, or clearly saw that all five aggregates are empty, thus relieved all suffering. That clear seeing is a really important term. Um, we translate it as clear seeing. It could also be luminous seeing. That has that kind of um, uh, connotation to it as well. So the clear seeing, another way we could, this part here where he says, when you emit the original light, which is beyond the dimension of thought and illuminate the illusory mind. You could also say, when you clearly see by emitting the fundamental light of non-thinking. So it's a little bit different. Clearly seeing by emitting the fundamental light of non-thinking fundamental light of non-thinking. Non-thinking, we talked about that last week, thinking, not thinking, non-thinking. This is this instructions for Zazen. So that non-thinking here, he refers to that as the, emis the emitting of a fundamental light. That when we practice the non-thinking, that there's this fundamental light which is emitted. It is the light of Verchana Buddha, which is not any different than us. Um, and that's why he says here that uh, the world becomes Verachana Tathagata. You don't just become Verachana Tathagata because you just can't be Verachana Tathagata. If you're Verachana Tathagata, all beings are Verachana Tathagata. And that's what emitting the light means, that you and all beings are luminous, which is different than saying you're all one. Notice he doesn't say you all become one. He says you're all the body of Verachana Buddha. Verachana Buddha is made up of earth, water, fire, wind, and space. Okay. But Verachana Buddha is all inclusive of earth, water, fire, wind, and space. It's not like a, there's no obstruction there. That's the, um, that's the kind of point that, the, that he's making. And then this is my favorite line here. At the bottom, he says, when the light quietly illuminates, the whole universe. Notice how we're not quietly illuminating. That's the part I really like there. He's not like, when you finally find out the real truth and everything turns into a massive Pink Floyd concert, you know, and there's just light everywhere, and it's like, you are the one. Yeah. And then that's when this happens. He says, when it quietly illuminates, when it's like, oh, oh, non thinking is not a laser light show. Yeah. <laughs> Ordinary beings and all other living beings are just one family. That's kind of a nice, I think a nice term. When we, we get a little bit addicted to the idea of oneness, 
Here he says one family. So I don't know about you, but by family, everybody's pretty different. (laughs) But we all have weird noses. (laughs) So this is kind of the, um, uh, you know, there's something which is similar. Yeah, there's something in which you're all part of the same family, but you're also all individual. That 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 kind of thing um, is uh, not only possible, but it's just uh, it's very natural, actually. You know, if you if you go like you admire the trees these days, they're lo- losing their leaves now. They're mostly all down, but you know, like you look at a maple tree and the leaves. This year's so beautiful. The colors were so um, vibrant. And then, but if you look at any given leaf, it's like, oh yeah, they're all maple leaves. If you don't pay attention, they're just all maple leaves, right? And you think they're all the same. But if you look at them closely, like you could just get lost. Get lost in the um, wonderful multiplicity of these things which are the same. And, uh, um, and that's a little bit less, um, you know, cosmological or kind of, um, um, uh, I don't know, uh, philosophical. It's just our direct experience is actually that way. Mm-hmm. Is this the relationship to the elements the same as in as what's being described in the harmony of difference and sameness with the four elements returning to their nature? Yeah. Yeah. Just as a child turns to his mother. Yeah. Yeah. And in that case, I don't know I don't know why that that's that the why the, the four elements it is four elements there, isn't it? I don't know why. It's usually five. This also corresponds to like five prong vajra. All of those things, five is really big. The four was bigger in India. Five is really big in China. In fact, in China, it's like five is the number. So you get a lot of things in fives because five is the number. Five is just more dynamic than four. It really is. I think like four is kind of square <laughs> <laughs> and sort of inert. You know, it has that kind of quality, um, which is good. Like you want to bring things into like the, imbi- you know, there's a reason earth is the square. Right? Because it comes into a kind of solidity, but that solidity also then becomes a certain kind of bones. So it's supportive, but also as a kind of ignorance, because now you're you're kind of trapped in the solidity of something. You start playing with this stuff, which I know you do all the time this with the, tarot. This is tarot. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This add the space to the tarot. Yeah. Because space is the, uh, is yeah. the major um, Great. That all sounds pretty good. Does that sound pretty good? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have more notes here. Oh, I had these backwards. That's what I was. <laughs> Oh, no, I, I get it now. Yeah, I was going to talk about the koans, but maybe we won't because we don't have that much time and there's other things to go through. And talking about koans in the end is a little bit futile anyway. Um, let's look at the, at the end of that section um, uh, on page 39, the last full paragraph on 39. He says, there's an old saying which expresses this same meaning. If one truly realizes the mind, there is not one inch of extra land on the great earth. We can equally say that if one truly realizes the earth, there will not be an inch of thought in our mind. That is why Shakyamuni on attaining the way said, the earth, living beings, and non-living beings, and I have all attained the way at the same time. This also expresses the reality of body, mind, and the world being just one. So this, you, you'll hear this in the Fusatsu ceremony, for example. He'll say, there will, there will not be an inch of ground. Mm-hmm. Not an inch of ground is the very classical way to say it. He, he makes it a little bit, a little bit longer here. Right? In the whole earth, there is not an inch of ground. So if you go back to this... No, you can't pick out even one square inch of ground. If you point at any one square inch, you're talking about the whole thing. And if you're talking about the whole thing, you're talking about any one, one square inch. So this is why in the Prajna Paramita Sutras, it says that um, there is no place to stand. The Bodhisattva, the armor of the Bodhisattva is that there is no place to stand. There's no, there's no ground on which you can say, okay, this is the ground I'm standing on. And um, because of that, the Buddha's awakening is an awakening in which all beings, the great earth, are awakened at the same time. 
because you can't carve out one you can't carve out one piece there's a wholeness to it the really tricky thing about this is it very easily slips into then like our desire to destroy all differences and that's not what it's saying it's saying just as things are in all of their multiplicity there's nothing that you can carve out as being an inch and i think that's why he translates it here as an extra uh extra land he says if one realizes the mind there is not one inch of extra land on the great earth it doesn't actually say extra in the in the saying it just says there's not an inch of ground um but the reason he uses extra is because he's trying to say like there's no there's nothing outside of the wholeness of the thing to claim as being like this this uh, kind of special place now the interesting thing that's a, this very classical uh, um, teaching but he turns it around then um, when he says um, we can equally say um, that if one truly realizes the earth there will not be an inch of thought in our mind so if the earth is totally realized, there won't be any room for thinking. There won't be any room for this constant remuneration that we do in this dividing and saying, oh, I want this side and not that side. Um, so this is very profound. And even though, even though earth is ignorance, you know, in the mind, he's also saying, well, then the ignorance, are parti ignorance is about partiality, right? We can only see part of it. And we don't realize that there's a whole... He's saying that even, even that, that earth, which is that kind of ignorance, we can do it completely. And in the completeness of doing it, then we come to uh, realize there's no movement possible or necessary. That's why in Zazen, um, you know, Dogen Zenji said to set up the body in the midst of delusion uh, and to be awakened before our own enlightenment. So like we take... We take the illusion that I'm bones and moisture and fire and all of those things, because I am. Even though it's diluted, I am. And that, that's what sets up as all that. Right? And I do that completely. Completely engage that. And then that becomes where the luminosity can be known. Again, the delusion and the awakening aren't split apart. They're um, um, integral to each other. Okay, cause and effect. We're just really rocking and rolling. We'll try to finish up a little bit early so we have plenty of time for, um, for questions. So if this is all kind of spatial stuff, then uh, Dogen goes into uh, time. And I had mentioned this, I think, last week or the week before that a little bit, when, when Buddhism goes into talking about time, and then it talks about cause and effect. Okay, So self and other spatial type relationships that's one side then in time cause and effect is the main way that relationships are talked about and i love this image that he gives here about the poppy seed you read about that in a few different places but i never anyone quite thoroughly explains it like this so he says he says that um, um the uh, cause and effect happen in different times and um they unfold um and that's that's the next section in the different times that they unfold but we don't really believe it. We don't really, we don't really see it. Um, and then he says it's like a poppy seed. If someone were to show you a poppy seed and you've never seen poppies before, and they were like, inside this seed, and those of you know what poppy seeds are like, right? Like they're tiny. Like you get them in your lemon scones, right? They're just little. And someone was to say, inside this seed, there are fields and fields of unbelievably colorful flowers. They're red and they're orange and they're yellow and it got big and they're right. You would just be like, you're crazy, right? He says, but actually that poppy seed, in that poppy seed, that's all there. And he said, this is what cause and effect is like. And, um, but because we're blind to cause and effect, we think that one small good action now or one small evil action now doesn't have much effect. Just like we don't believe that the poppy seed has these kinds of effects. One note about the terms good and evil, which are so loaded for us. Um, you guys ever listen to David Byrne? Anyone ever listen to David Byrne? You listen to Good and Evil? He's got a song called Good and Evil. 
Look at that. If you like David Byrne, listen to that. It's just crazy. Good and evil. Good and evil. Turn them loose and they turn into people. And I, so when I read good and evil, that's why I always, it's always kind of running through my, uh, through my head. But we have so much, like, especially in this, when you're in a, a very bifurcated, dualistic uh, type uh, tradition where good and evil are essential, like essential building blocks, it gets, hy- it gets hyped up in a certain way. Not making a judgment call on that, but just saying that's very different than where it comes from in Buddhism. Super relative to each other or super not disconnected. They're super connected, right? And in their essential sense, good could be translated as skillful and evil as unskillful. Now, they, there's different words that get used. Like in the Chinese, usually there's two characters and one is good and one is evil. But evil isn't just like independently existing, permanently abiding evil. <laughs> good is not independently existing, permanently abiding good. That these are um, that these are always in connection with, with each other. And the reason I bring up skillful and unskillful, or we could say like a helpful or unhelpful, or we could say liberating and um, and uh, binding. There's different words we could use there, but they all point towards how how does this karma point towards liberation or head towards liberation and how does it end towards more suffering within the wheel of um, samsara and that's that's the definition right not whether it's lucifer's doing or god's doing it's like that it's it's that's the the thing it is very emphasized that you will know the cause by the effect okay the issue is most of the effects you don't get to see or we don't get to see because of our ignorance. And part of that is because we don't really believe that they're going to be there. And so we are already disconnected from the effect once we get to the effect because we don't realize it. Um, and then he says this, I, th- I think is a really beautiful thing on page uh, um, 40 at the bottom of the first full paragraph. It's just a few lines from the bottom. And he's talking about the Buddha. And he says, the reason the Buddha taught cause and effect is that he saw the flowers and seeds within one seed. The Buddha could just see. Oh, he sees one seed and he sees all the flowers. Now this part of this is talking about what is the nature of a Buddha's consciousness laid out in time. If this is total luminosity in space, the Buddha's consciousness is also total luminosity through time, undivided time where there is a past, present, and future, but the past, present, and future are not divided. So we oftentimes hear that translate something as the omnipotence of the Buddha, that the Buddha isn't seeing time as an unfolding process, but the Buddha just sees the wholeness of time, or at least one facet of the Buddha. And this is why the Buddha, like in the Lotus Sutra, is able to give predictions of Buddhahood. So when the, when the followers come forward and he says, oh, you, so and so and so and so, in the future, you will be a Buddha called such and such. Many, 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 many kalpas from now, you will be a, you will be a Buddha called such and such, and you will live in this kind of assembly, and this is what the quality of your pure land will be like, etc., etc. And he does that for every disciple, all the way down to Devadetta, who's like the bad guy, right? Tried to kill the Buddha and do all this other stuff, and even he is a prediction of a prediction of Buddhahood. That's the kind of quality of the Mahayana. And the idea here is that the Buddha um, uh, can see the wholeness of things. And in the wholeness of things can recognize people's Buddhahood um, not locked in time, just like the Buddha isn't locked in space. The Buddha isn't underneath the Bodhi tree and then everybody is locked out of awakening. That the Buddha being there in the Bodhi tree is the awakening of all, of all beings. That's the kind of image. And then he makes a really nice, strong case here for doing good and abandoning evil, which I think is really refreshing. We don't have enough of that, I don't think. I often tell the story of my teacher when, he, when he, one day I was asking him questions about something, and he said, you know what the problem with modern society is? We don't talk about hell enough. And I was like, oh, I think I mis- misunderstood you, Master. And he was like, yeah, we need to get those scrolls out where people are burning and having their tongues pulled out of their head and all this sort of stuff. And I was like, oh, I don't think I did misunderstand you. Um, but... I really, I, as much as I was saying, you know, like kind of lampooning some of the more dualistic thinking, which isn't so nice, uh, uh, but the, um, but 
if we understand the connection of this here, we can see why understanding, like really fearing evil is important. Not just because you're going to burn in a lake of fire for all eternity, but because you have a chance to do something else. Even if you're burning in a lake of fire now, you have a chance to do something else. And that's the deep message of Buddhism, is that there are always, you're going to transmigrate. Right? You're going to keep going. And so you should do the good things and you should leave behind the evil things. And the reason is because the good things, by definition, lead to liberation. They're not just about making things more pleasurable, etc. They're about creating the environment in which um, something else can happen. And when you're locked in the negative side of the karmic cycle, there's almost no capacity to do anything else. When you're on the positive side, there is. And the positive side, the, the hardest place is in the heavens. I love that about Buddhism. It's like, yeah, rebirth there is pretty groovy and everything, but no final awakening. Can't happen there. Because there's ignorance, there's forgetfulness of, of suffering. And the Asuras, a little bit closer because they, they get it, they've fallen out of heaven. But the human realm is really the realm that is, um, that is considered to be the best place because it's right in that median place. We still have suffering, we remember suffering, and we're concerned about what it means to, uh, to get off, which the other realms don't have the same type of concern, or we can be concerned about. Uh huh. Well, in terms of, of good and evil, yeah. it seems to me that uh, we think of evil in technicolor, you know, big, mm -hmm. destructive mm -hmm. behaviors. Yeah. Uh, there's a, there's a streams of incipient evil yeah. that happen to children yeah. in ways that are not obvious. Yeah. Uh, there's all kinds of subtle yeah. subtlety yeah. that, uh, so that, also means the line is not just, yeah. is, is not, and anyway, this could go on, yeah. but. Um, that's why I really like that he, use, he uses the image of the poppy seed. Exactly. Is that um, we, there is big evil, yes. but it has roots in, um, in a lot of things. And the roots are, can be hard to see. Right. Like just like the little, um, where the earth and the roots of plants become kind of indistinguishable. And that's where the nutrients for the whole plant really are derived from the same thing so you know I really encourage people it's hard because we can be so we, we can get so stiff when we try to um, root out the evil and embrace the good and and that isn't helpful but ultimately we need to be unbelievably precise exactly. like like even a tiny mistruth and a mistruth here means not that you mistook it but it means that you intentionally spun it a different direction, right? You didn't say exactly what you saw it to be. You said something slightly different to get what you want or to avoid something you don't. That, even that, has a massive effect, right? And so um, he's inviting us into a very meticulous way of living, which, uh, which I think is very, very important issue for us, especially in the kind of Puritan indoctrination that a lot of us have, is that goes to teetotaler stiffness as opposed to real investigation of the good and the evil of something. We think we know what would be good or evil and then we lock down on it. Earlier on the text when he says that what's good for, um, what's good for a bodhisattva is bad for a shravaka, we can't always say so clearly what is good or bad. Um, but we should still focus our attention on um, embracing the good. Right. And, um, and because they're not divided, we'll never find that clear line. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then would, would you say that intention mm -hmm. is a part of this? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's in the classical understanding of good and evil, we're talking about good and evil as uh, our skillful and unskillful is a story about karma. And karma is not all kinds of cause and effect. Karma is the cause and effect of intention, or the cause and effect of how um, consciousness carries itself out. Uh -huh. 
and that's labeled as intention. I mean, intention is kind of too narrow of a word in English because we think intention means I have to be conscious of it. But in Buddhism, most of our intention we're not conscious of. So um, it's the movement of, of being that heads in some direction, um, skillful or unskillful. So that's really the reason to do it, is not to claim goodness for ourselves, but it helps us to root out the deep um, qualities of our intention or our karma. And, um, and there's liberation, and that's sweet. Like when, you, when one of those nuggets, those knots kind of unfolds, it's like, it's a hallelujah kind of moments. You know, so, um, but, and this is really important, he makes the strong case, and then he says, so do good, abandon evil, but don't hate, hate evil or like good. <laughs> Super important. And that's what I'm talking about, the way in which the kind of preciousness about being good creates a whole other kind of raft of problems. So he's like, abandon evil, do good, don't hate evil, don't like good. Do something that's actually beyond that, which is to practice, which is to receive and employ the body of the Buddha, which is what Jiju Zammai is. So the self-receiving and employing samadhi, which this is all about, that self-receiving and employing samadhi is the receiving of the body of their chana buddha as our own body and then employing the luminosity of that body of their chana buddha. And he's making a strong case that the way to do that is non-thinking, otherwise known as zazen. Right? Um, so so that, that's what we're trying to do in working with good and evil not covet good and hate evil because that just ends up creating the same you know the same problem in the first place actually we should be aimed um, to liberation not even liking and being attached to goodness much less should we dislike it yeah that's very that's very nice and then he says this really um cool thing which i think is on the next page here yeah so on page 42 <laughs> Um, the bottom of that first full paragraph. He says, when we practice these three pure precepts without being attached to illusory mind, the three are not three, one is not one. The cause is not a cause, and effect is not an effect. There is no sooner or later, only Buddha's wisdom can clarify this. We must be free from our thought and discrimination. So he folds this back into this circle. He says, we're pra the practice of all this, if we're going to practice embracing good, it's not that we should really, really like good and hate evil. It's that what we're, ca what we're calling good is this full illumination of the Buddha's body. That's what we're calling good. And what we're calling evil is being mired more in the illusory mind. Right? So hating illusory mind is not going to do you any good. It's just a further activity of of the, of the divisiveness and loving the good, loving the wholeness, loving the luminosity isn't going to help you either. You're just going to clutch to your idea of what that is. Mm -hmm. There's something more fundamental. Bodhidharma said, better to have um, nothing at all than to have something good. <laughs> but he always makes a really <laughs> crazy face. So <laughs> take that for what <laughs> I, it would be kind of nice. We could have a Bodhidharma with a, like a big smile or a big laugh or something. People think it was Hote. Okay, last thing I'll go over and then I'll have a little time for questions. And this is the last part of the, um, of the teaching before it goes into the quotes from Dogen. And this is the three times bit. This starts on page 42. Right? And he talks about, this is very standard, um, fundamental Buddhist theory about karma that the effects of things take place in uh, one of three possible times. The present life, the next life, or some life after that. He says, could be three life, fourth, fourth life, hundredth life, a thousandth life. You know, that's how, that's how he's saying it. So it's not that it's the, like, this life, the next life, or the life after that. It's this life, the next life, or sometime in the future that we can't, um, we can't calculate. And then he, I love this thing he says. It says, when it's the present life, it's like planting cucumbers or um, eggplants. You plant them this year and you get them this year. And it's really clear to you. You're like, oh, I planted them and then I took care of them and now I have cucumbers and eggplants. Like that's one way that we recognize the effect in the cause and effect relationship. 
He said, in other times, we plant wheat this year, but we don't harvest it till next year. So we might remember the toil. We might still have some relationship between the connection. But, um, but it's, it's like the next life. And then he says, the other one is like a, planting a peach or a chestnut or a pear or a persimmon. You know, you plant it now, and then it's sometime in the future. You don't know when you're going to get a persimmon. Might be four or five years. Might be ten. Um, and so um, you don't see the connection. That reminded me of, I read this article once of cork farmers in Portugal. It's like a hundred years before they get the first harvest. And now that everyone's using screw tops for the wine, the cork that's really the best cork that's the most expensive is the, um, is the, are the wine corks. Everything else isn't valuable enough that you can make a living at it. So you get a lot of cork things now, like siding for a house or <laughs> for shoes or floors or different things like that. They, um, that's all kind of like the waste cork, basically. But the cork farmers aren't going to survive if there's not wine corks. So they're in this big conundrum now because they're harvesting the cork that like their great, great grandparents planted and you can only get so many harvests before the tree dies. And it's a huge amount of work to plant them and take care of them. And they're trying to decide, are we going to do all this work? And it's not even our grandkids that are going to get the benefit of it, right? And are they, is that even, is society even going to be cohesive enough for all of that? I thought it was so interesting. Like how to live in a real faith, like this great gift you're receiving from your ancestors. And then how do you carry it forward? We're all in that exact same position, but we just don't have the material trees to remind us of it all of the time. So um, anyway, food for thought. So, um, and then and in this section, he gives all these examples from history or from literary examples that a Japanese literati of this time would know all of those. These are like famous characters. If he was like, so for example, Daniel Boone was, I mean, that's not a literati knows that, but you know, we all know who Daniel Boone is, right? So it's, it's like that. Those are all those things. He's like, oh, f the thief, this, and nothing like that. Those are all like a, like a very common type of references. And remember, he's writing this for a group of, of uh, not of monks, but of, um, of followers that um, he's trying to encourage them to, um, to practice. And so using those kinds of, things. You may have picked up when you read this the number of times which he kind of um, um, disses Confucianism and Taoism. If that gets your ire a little bit, just know that there's a, there's, don't think of it as literal Confucianism of Taoism. Think of it as two punching bags for Buddhists <laughs> that help explain some things that they don't like, right? So those become the faces of it. Now the, uh, the, the Opposite is also true. Buddhism is one of the punching bags for uh, Taoism and Confucianism. So they, those three are in such tight connection with each other that there's oftentimes, it's kind of a caricature of this other way of thinking that is used to, um, to express something. So when he says like, well, Confucianism, Taoism didn't know anything about cause and effect. It's like, I don't think that's true. <laughs> um, but he's trying to make a point, right? And, um, uh, and so arguing with him isn't really, you know, isn't really the point. So, so we can think about this teaching and, and I think one thing, and he says this really clearly here is, one of the things that trips us up is we see people doing horrible things and having good effects in their life. Mm -hmm. What's up with that? Right? And so he's saying like, well, there's probably some good karma there. It hasn't run out yet, but the good effects are going to come at some point. Right? And I think that's kind of a, that's important. I, th I think of that as a relatively shallow interpretation. If you go a little bit deeper, <clears throat> what do you mean good effects? What are you magnetized about their good effects? People who are doing horrible things, like someone who does horrible things, is their family life happy? Or are you talking about they drive a Rolls Royce? Because mm -hmm. driving a Rolls Royce is not a symbol of things going well. <clears throat> but we get magnetized to it, right? So it's not necessarily a symbol of things going bad either, right? But it's just not, we are very hooked into certain marks about what life going well is and what life going not well is. So when we look at these effects of karma, if we're trying to interpret the effects of good deeds by people being wealthy or happy in a conventional way, we've kind of missed the point. It's talking about liberation. And liberation isn't going to show up as like 
the conventional way of life being successful. There's something else. So we have to, you know, a lot of that we can't really see. We can't see a person's heart or their mind. We maybe can, we can see um, something in the way that they act that might point us towards what's going on inside of there. But I would say most suffering is fairly opaque to us. We meet people and we don't, we can't really touch or know what the suffering is there. So I think that's a, maybe a deeper point to see that um, um, uh, we don't, you know, people who we think are doing not so good things but their life is going well, doesn't mean they're not suffering. You know, they might have bought Twitter, but... <laughs> You don't want to change a lazy, a lazy punching bag. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yep, it is. I'll take that with uh, um, uh, right out of the, off the shelf. <laughs> um, so there's another thing here that I would point people to thinking about. That um, in the same way that we talk about deluded and wise not being separable here, I think we also have to talk about good and evil as being inseparable in space, but also in time. So if we talk about deluded beings in the Buddha in space, and we say that, you know, don't, don't, don't think that the donkey staring in the well is going to dissolve the donkey. We should also not think that that's going to happen in, in time, that we should divide out the, the deluded from the awakened and just try to have the awakened um, a part of life uh, in space. That, one of the things I think is important about that is it helps us develop the right posture to our own life. That we don't hate the evil that we do in our life, but we still endeavor to overcome it. And we don't like the good, but we still endeavor to embrace it because that's where the deeper luminosity comes from and the sympathy for others and the compassion for others that are also caught in the, in the wheel. Um, um, that's where it emerges from. And then finally he says, um, this is the, uh, on page 44, um, the first full paragraph. He says, both good and evil causes have limitations. Therefore, we receive limited effects. Hell and heaven also have limitations. This is because these actions are caused by the limited illusory mind. If you omit Buddha's wisdom and refrain from evil deeds and carry out good without thought and discrimination, follow in accord with your nature and look beyond limitations, all your deeds will result in the effects of ultimate awareness and complete perfect virtue. And then he, and then he talks about the, these practices. So this line where he says, um, oh, I lost it here. Look beyond limitations. Follow in accord with your nature and look beyond limitations. So I think this is a key, this is a key point in cause and effect. Not that we're just trying to do something to create a certain effect, but we're looking beyond the limitations. And anything of the good that we're doing or the evil that we're embracing, we're looking to that. This goes back to things like when we talk about generosity. Don't give a gift with the idea of the merit that it will produce. Otherwise, the merit it will produce is greatly diminished. Simply endeavor to give a gift. That's, these are kind of teachings of the parent. So the rest of the text are quotes from Dogen Zenji about Jiji Zammai. And really, the great news is a whole bunch of them are from a text called Bendowa. Mm -hmm. And that's what our head student in the spring, Jikie, will be teaching from. So um, uh, you need not <laughs> lose the thread. Um, I encourage you to read those you know, over the next few mm -hmm. months. They're, it's really good reading on um, during the holidays. <laughs> um, and, um, and they're nice because they're just little chunks. And you can um, you can read it and get a get a sense. We have a couple of minutes. If anyone has any final questions or exclamations of um, joy or sorrow, I just want to 
Mm-hmm. I don't think he helps us know how to do good and refrain from evil at all. I come away from this like this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's no. There, it's not like there's. I mean, except holding on to the conventional teachings that he's now kind of helped us see as. Mm-hmm. Completely the same thing as the one responded to Buddha. Mm-hmm. So practice the paramitas with conventional mm-hmm. understanding. Mm-hmm. Have faith in that. I mean, is that? But I kind of still want to. I think I think he goes farther than that because he, in like what I was just saying, he's saying look beyond the limitations. So if you actually try to practice good without liking the good, if you actually try to practice dropping off the evil without hating the evil. That's what the practice of the of the paramita is. He doesn't go in to talk about specific ethical things. He could, he could, but he doesn't hear. Um, but he's giving us the, the, um, the instruction about how we should engage any particular ethical um, pursuit. And that, in that sense, I think he does. Um, that, we ha- that we actually have to make the effort there. Now to understand what that is exactly, you know, is a whole, would be a whole nother line of inquiry. Like what is, what is um, um, not uh, um, uh, speaking untruth? What, what even does it mean to refrain from evil without trying to root out the loose of mind? Mm-hmm. When he says to stop, when he, when, here when he says to cease evil, um, he always refers to the uh, embracing codes and forms. So that's an important point. He goes back to a code and a form that has been established and received. And he says, watch out for these things. Now they're different in this case than the Bodhisattva precepts. They're different than the Vinaya precepts, which are behavioral um, um, rules for regulating the community. Um, Neither are they commandments in the same way that Abrahamic commandments are commandments, mitzvahs. But he, he, he uses, um, um, he points at those codes as being something that comes from beyond ourself. It's not just our own deliberation which is going to allow us to understand what it means to restrict um, evil. That there's something we have to respond to um, the teachings of the ancestors um, and what's been entrusted us through the, through the lineage. So in that, think, in that sense I think he does. But he does lean very heavily. I mean, he's trying to make a point. It is Jiju Zanmai, right? So he's trying to make a point about this is all connected back to Jiju Zanmai. So even your ethical inquiry is about this luminosity of Verachana. And that's, I think, what his goal is, is to make that connection. Mm-hmm. So, okay. Can I try to formulate a question? Mm-hmm. Complicated question. Um, riffs off what was just said a second ago. It's um, I'm trying to get at this thing, which seems to be some intuition about purpose. And it's kind of like the more you practice, the more practice pulls you along. Almost like there's some guiding principle here that's impossible to understand that has almost nothing to do with good and evil. It's almost as if there's some kind of can make up words here, like a tether or a road or a space that we are entering that um, we can't help but do the right thing if you stick with it. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's like an idea here. Let's bring that for a second. When I look at the system, which I think I, this, this text, I think I understand to some degree mm-hmm. over the years of accumulated mm-hmm. some knowledge, and then I juxtapose it against other systems that I'm aware of, and I go, well, there's probably an infinite number of systems one could construct that could roughly articulate the same truth, mm-hmm. roughly. Um, and you could invert this and hope all sorts of interesting ways, kind of as a mathematical object, to express the same essential truth. And so there's this like, tension between, is that getting at something, is there something we can get at that's essentialist in that? It's gonna, it's gonna then push you back towards this question, is there really some we say something about what's really guiding the whole machinery? Or are we forever lost in sort of an infinity of different possible interpretations? We can't actually divine out really what's going on here. I don't know if I've made 
it's not. Yeah, so uh, two, uh, two responses. Um, the easy response is that's why orthopraxy is the dominant emphasis of the, of the school. That the theory is important, but actually, if the theory is relatively workable, then try to carry it out. And then in the carrying out, there's traction. And the, the multiplicity of different systems or anything like that becomes less relevant. That, the, um, that the, the traction that we have within the way that we're conceiving of it is limited it is, like acknowledging it's limited, but in the carrying it out, part of my job is to discover its limitations and then to um, uh, you know, forge ahead. I'm in a dark forest sometimes, sometimes there's a clearing, sometimes I can see clearly, sometimes I can't, and that um, practice uh, occurs there rather than inside the container of the theory of what the practice is. So that one I think is kind of uh, um, like the sort of the very straightforward Zen type answer to, you know, a, a picture of a rice cake doesn't fill your stomach. Mm -hmm. Well, we can also read Dogen's fascicle on that where he says, what is not a picture of a rice cake, which takes us off on another thing. So that's one. If we go back to the theory itself, I think one of the things that's really interesting about this about this, and you could see it in other types of theology or cosmological kind of things, but it's where does that road emerge from? In this way of thinking, it has to do with, um, um, and I talked about this a little bit earlier um, in the class, I can't remember when, I think it was pretty early on, is this term that's uh, called perfuming. Um, and the idea is that there is the completely undifferentiated, whole and luminous, and then there is the total particular. And those two can never reconcile with each other. They never, they never one becomes partly the other. And that's what we've been talking a lot about through this whole, through this whole thing. But they actually affect each other because they're not a separate place. They're not, they're the same Virachana Buddha. And because Virachana Buddha could be talked about in the total multiplicity or in the total um, undifferentiated luminosity, those two, there's a path that emerges because of that. And one way we could think about this is if we think about this circle as a, um, having a front and back side, that the side that we're looking at, we call the scene, the side we can see, and the backside is what we can't see, right? The side that's seen is always going to be made up of particulars. There's going to be all the multiplicity um, here. When we don't understand that there is the total undifferentiated luminosity, which is the, what we can't see, what we do is we try to relate like this. Everything's in a network of, of, I know who I am because I'm not you. I know who I am because I'm closer to you. We're all, it's all about these kind of connections. That's what here he's calling delusion. But this side actually is not separate from that total luminosity, which we can't see. It's not of the nature of being seen. That's why light is a really good uh, kind of, um, word for it. It's like light that hasn't bounced off anything. Or it's total darkness. That's the other thing you could call it. Because that's there, actually, for me, if this is for me and this other thing that shows up in the scene, I don't have to relate with it at all. Because we're not, there's no separation in the first place. We're all, we're all from the, the, the side of total illumination, um, we are not of the nature of being differentiated, even though in the world of the scene, we're totally different. This has a, a, a practical effect on how it is that we carry out our life. So when I'm trying to relate with this person, like say I'm trying to relate to their suffering, let's just say it's a person, and I'm trying to relate with it. I'm like, oh, how do I help this person? How do I help this person? And 
I'm only thinking in that relational, I can do a lot of good, but I can't liberate. Right? I just further compound this belief that I'm me and they're them. But there's another place where I can turn where the true listening of compassion is liberating. And that could be literal listening, but it could also be helping in some way and being present with another person. And when we experience that, then we see there's another way. It's not about, it's not about devising the way that I can be helpful. It is the presence itself um, brings about a different kind of world. That feels like a path. That feels like a thing we're drawn into. It feels like a thing that we're, especially in the traditional teaching, we'd say we can never, we can never get to that ourselves. The only way we get to it is we meet it in another being. In the classical sense, that's the bodh bodhisattvas, and that kind of communication we have with them. You know, we meet we meet something we think is a a, a being a person or a vision that we have or whatever it is and then we realize they're not a being they are the universe and maybe that's you know our granddaughter or maybe that's um, you know a, a, a beautiful waterfall or whatever it is and in that moment we know something different so um, anyway the way I'm going all into this is what you were saying about like that pulling that pulling in that's why he emphasizes this so much, is that it really does become a way of life to try to live through, not through how do I relate more correctly with everything, but how do I look beyond that to this more fundamental truth about how we are. And, um, uh, and, that, and, that, and again, I think you're exactly right. That could show up in a whole bunch of different ways. And there's actually, Buddhism says there's countless Buddhas and countless universes that teach their Dharma, which maybe doesn't sound like this. <laughs> I, I really appreciate yeah. what you just said in yeah. our explanation and I have to ask the next question. Yeah. Yeah. It's, just, it's just so interesting. To me. Yeah. This is that uh, the thing this comes from, uh -huh. we talk about it in this, yes. we just talk about it in this very rational way. Yeah. And I guess the question that I keep wanting to ask, or that's in my head is, is the is this uh, essentialness, is it, is it fundamentally irrational? Can we ever really know about its construction in this sense? It's not, so... Uh, like, I mean, we'll, like, literally, like, some of the things we might need to do to right. actually fulfill that path may seem... Uh, they just may seem so crazy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, on that side, I would say uh, Buddhas. The, the, the classical answer would be uh, only a Buddha alone together with a Buddha can fathom this. And so I would say that on a practical level, what I find is the abandonment of rationality is super important. And, the, and these kind of rational explanations help us give a context for the abandoning of the rationality that is not just like run down the street and go, Bleh! kind of irrational. It's like, oh, it's, it's, it's a kind of irrationality that has purpose. And oftentimes we, I think we equate irrationality with lack of purpose as opposed to lack of, um, lack of trying to hold on to the meaning. And so much of Zen teaching is trying to encourage us to jump beyond what we know. And that's very irrational, but it's irrationality that's it's like totally significant. It's like ultimately significant. And um, I think we had discussed this a, a, a number of weeks back, the... Um, there's a Christian mystic um, whose name is not coming to me right now. Nicholas of Cusa. Yeah, Nicholas of Cusa, who he has a, um, you know, his explanation, which is a nice, neat little package, is he says the, the gateway to heaven is the opposites, the irreconcilable opposites. And the only way that you can enter into heaven is, to, is a, like basically a um, uh, acceptance of these irreconcilable opposites. Um, but that's, that's with a great purpose, right? Um, it's not just to um, kind of stop thinking about it or something. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Right. Okay, well, do that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, please enjoy, uh, please enjoy, uh, uh, we, we have class, we have things going on on um, Sundays uh, um, and so Tuesday night classes and stuff happening. Rohatsu sessions happening in a couple of weeks. If you're planning on doing that or coming to part of it, um, uh, please register. I encourage this on Sunday for those of you who are here. Um, uh, it, lots of people can't 
can't, don't want to, aren't in a place to, whatever, coming to a whole rohatsu session, and that's unbelievably understandable. Most people shouldn't be able to do it, um, like you work and stuff like that. Um, but we have sitting every night and, um, and also every morning. And so um, I really encourage people, come in the evenings. It's a really great thing to do. Just say like, oh, I'm going to come all week in the evenings, or I'm going to come in the morning, or I'm going to come for the first two sits in the evening, or whatever it is. There's a talk most nights. Um, and just join in the flow of that important celebration of the Buddha's awakening. And, um, um, and it's, uh, um, it's quite, um, that's a quite profound thing to do. And, uh, and it, um, to be together with the community through that is, uh, is great. And then um, I'm going to start trumpeting um, from this, uh, this Sunday. I'm always a little disappointed about how few people come on New Year's Day. So clear your calendar. <laughs> There's mochi. I, I, I can just say it's, it's a wonderful thing to do on New Year's Day. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it really is. It's always the question, what are we doing? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And we don't start early, so you know you can sleep right, in right. if you've been staying up and eating brownies or something. I know that's what people do on New Year's Day. Eating brownies. Yeah. Oh, we can.